There are 2,799 registered Negro children of school age. There are 295 white children. The state has now provided those 2,800 Negro children with schools that are, as Mr. Marshall has so positively admitted, equal in every respect. In fact, because of their being newer, they may even be better than the schools of the 295 white children. Now, who's going to disturb that situation? If these children were to be reassorted on a mathematical basis, you would have 27 Negro children and three white children in each schoolroom. Would that make the children any happier? Would they learn more quickly? Your Honors cannot sit as a glorified Board of Education for the state of South Carolina or any other state. Nor, I respectfully submit, can this court sit in the chairs of the legislature of South Carolina and mold its educational system. The state establishes the schools. It pays the funds. And it has the sole power to educate its citizens. The state of South Carolina does not come here in sackcloth and ashes. Its laws do not offend the Constitution of the United States. It is convinced that the happiness, the progress, and the welfare of these children is best promoted in segregated schools. And it would be a thousand pities that by this controversy, it might be ordered to abandon what it has created. I am reminded of Aesop's fable of the dog and the meat. The dog with a fine piece of meat in his mouth crossed a bridge. He saw the shadow in the stream and he plunged for it. And he lost both the shadow and the substance. Now here is equal education, not prophesied, but present. Shall it be thrown away on some, some fancied question of racial prestige? It is not my part to offer advice to the appellants, and certainly not to the learned counsel. No doubt they think what they propose is best. But I entreat them to remember the age-old motto that the best is often the enemy of the good. Mr. Marshall, you have five minutes for rebuttal. May it please the court. The 14th Amendment was put into our Constitution after one of the worst wars ever fought. The duty of enforcing the 14th Amendment is placed upon this court to make sure that the states in administering their functions, disregard little pet feelings about race. The Negroes who are forced to submit to segregation are all American citizens who, by accident of birth, are a different color. And the color makes no difference one way or another insofar as this court is concerned. Harry Briggs Jr. is guaranteed by the state some 12 years of education. There is no way you can repay lost school years. They say, leave it to the states until they work it out. I got the feeling on hearing the discussion earlier that when you put a white child in a school with a whole lot of colored children, the child would fall apart. Everyone knows that is not true. Those same kids 
in Virginia and South Carolina, and I have seen them do it. They play in the streets together. They separate to go to school. They come out of school and play ball together. But they have to be separated in school. There must be some magic to it. You can have them going to the same state university and to the same college, but if they go to elementary and high school together, the world will fall apart. The only way that this court can decide this case in opposition to our position is to find some reason which gives the state the right to make a classification in regards to Negroes that they can make in regard to nothing else. And we submit The only way to arrive at this decision is to find that for some reason, Negroes are inferior to all other human beings. Nobody will stand in this court and say that because they would have to justify it. can only be one thing. An inherent determination that the people who were formerly in slavery shall be kept as near that condition as is possible. Now is the time we submit that this court should make it clear that that is not what the Constitution of the United States stands for. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. I know it's crab soup. Hot. Mm. And good. Very. We can see Douglas and Black to the other side. Now, Reed and Clark should vote with us. Jackson and Frankfurter are leaning towards our point of view. It's judicial restraint. Now, that's four. And we should pick up another vote from Minton or from Burton or from Chief Justice Warren. How are you getting on with the new chief? I've discovered that he listens, though he is untutored in the law. Well, it could be argued that's an ideal combination for Chief Justice. Open-minded and flexible. Well, I hope you all get down to it. It's not that tough a call, as I see it. For those who do not have to decide, it is easy. The humanitarian thing to do is to strike down segregation. But nothing presented to us, neither history nor legal precedent, offers any help. I think Jackson wants to toss it to Congress. The authority for enforcing the 14th Sir? Amendment... Sir, if I may, the Negroes are the group for whom the 14th Amendment was written. 
It's for their protection, and since 1868, everybody else has come to this court invoking the protection of the 14th Amendment. Corporations and Chinese and aliens and everybody else come in and claim they've been denied equal protection of the laws. They come to the Supreme Court of the United States, and you listen to them. And if you find that their rights have been violated, then you take care of them. But when the one group for whose protection the 14th Amendment was written, the Negroes come in and ask you for relief, Jackson wants you to say yes. Your constitutional rights have been violated, but don't come to us. You go across the street, you ask Congress to give you relief. We're not going to give you a thing. Mark. At Harvard, I would have given you an A for that. Tempus Fugit. I'm exactly where I was one year ago. I'm prepared to vote to desegregate. And if my vote should be in the minority, I shall write as strong a dissent as I know how. After reading over 1,500 pages, I have yet to discover a basis in the Constitution or the 14th Amendment that allows us to order the states to do with their schools that which they do not wish to do. Well, I was very taken by something Mr. Thurgood Marshall said. The only way the court can decide this case in opposition to our position is to find that for some reason, Negroes are inferior to all other human beings. Hugo, I base my view on the law, and nothing in the law tells us that we can tell South Carolina to abolish separate schools. This country has been making great strides in race relations. A careless decision here could halt that progress. How do you see that happening, Stanley? If the American people feel that a bunch of liberals in Washington are forcing their social views on the states, there will be profound resentment. I've seen the race problem more closely than most of you. I'm concerned about the possibility of violence, massive resistance. What if we say desegregate and they refuse? Can we send the army into South Carolina to enforce it? Send the army into 20 states? I am surprised that the history provides so little in the way of legal footing for striking down segregation. I find I'm arguing with myself. My heart tells me segregation is wrong. The law tells me not to interfere with the states. I do not like the idea of segregation, but for a hundred years, the South has had segregated school systems and this court has told them it was legal. We can't just turn on a dime and say tomorrow morning things will be different. Nor can we continue to say that in the United States of America, all men are equal, but that white men are more equal than others. For God's sake, let's decide the principle. We can remain flexible on how to implement it. Disaster. This court is expected to be precise and clear. Felix, you say you're arguing with yourself. Perhaps you'd prepare a memorandum outlining the issues and offering some suggestions as to where our choices lie. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> Our great civil libertarian is going to get us in the soup. Douglas is so abrasive. He makes conciliation and compromise even more difficult. He obviously feels very deeply. Douglas is a great humanitarian in the abstract. He just can't stand people. Almost ready. Sir, these will be better than your city shoes. Well, thank you, Mr. Patterson. You know the roads, Mr. Patterson. Oh, yes, sir. I've been out this way many times before. The war between the states is one of my hobbies. Manassas, Bull Run, just a short drive from the city. You ever been to Gettysburg before, sir? No, no. For me, one of the pleasures of living in the East will be to see some of these things. Little round top. Meade had the high ground. He had the artillery, too. 
That was the whole story. In the winter of 1944 in Italy, we were pinned down in the Circhio Valley for two weeks. Jerry's had the hilltop. They were pouring their 88s down in on us. Flooded us real bad. Taught me a whole lot about the value of high ground. So simple, yet so strong. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us. But from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. But we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish of the earth. On to Manassas, sir. Good morning, sir. Mr. Patterson, why are you sleeping in there? Sir, I couldn't find a place. Sir, there's no place within 20 miles of here where I... Let's get back to Washington. treated as entire citizens of the society into which they've been born. Come in, Mark. It's Earl Warren. Oh. Felix. Felix, this court must vote to desegregate. I believe that this is a moral issue, one that goes deep into the soul of our nation. The more I ponder this, the more I believe the separate but equal idea is based on the concept that the colored race is inferior, and that those who sustain it must be willing to acknowledge that. Now. I believe my vote will make a majority of five. I will assign the writing of the opinion to myself. I hope to write it in a way that will bring others with me. What do I have to do to have you with me? You're a man from the hurly-burly of public life, Earl. I'm a man from the private world of the jurist. We both know what is right here. But to you, it seems less complicated. Neither history nor legal precedent gives us reason. But there are times when the court must be free to interpret the Constitution based on the changes in men's feeling for what is right and just. The humanitarian goal will have to do. But if you force a sharply divided decision, you will have accomplished no good. You must work to unite the court. How, Felix? 
Jackson. You must persuade him to vote with us and not to write a separate opinion. You must talk to him, convince him, and then if you're successful, Clark, he should follow. Stanley Reed will be the most difficult. Can Reed be turned? Only by you, but Jackson first. If you write an opinion, I will study it with an open mind. That's all I ask. But an open mind cannot change my belief that this matter rightfully belongs to the Congress. Earl, you are looking for a congenial political solution to the problem. I'm looking for a way to do what I think we both believe is the right thing to do. The only possible way, in my view, to write a decision to end segregation with intellectual honesty is to argue that the majestic generalities of the Constitution have a content and a significance that vary from age to age. Yes? I don't like it, but you can try it. With the court, all I can do is wait. Buster, the time I got the job as a waiter with the Baltimore in Ohio, your daddy got you that job. They handed me a uniform. White coat. Black pants that fit real nice, except they stop just above the ankles, six inches too short. I went to the man in charge and I said, Sir, I need to have another pair of pants. These are too short. The man looked me over and you know what he said? He said, don't you know it's easier for me to get a shorter nigra? than it is to get another uniform. It makes me angry. That was a long time ago. Mm -mm. I mean about being sick. Changes are coming. Changes we never dared dream of. And I may not see them.
Mr. McHugh, Mr. Patterson, work to do. Now, if you would type this, please. Yes, sir. I will review it. And then, Mr. Patterson, if you would take it to the print shop and order nine copies. Only nine. Yes, sir. May I guess why you're here? I will vote to desegregate. If. If the opinion gives the southern states time. We are not dealing just with law. We are dealing with a social revolution. It needs time. You read that, Tom. It may need some refinement. I'd like to accommodate your view. Stanley, I've written this opinion in a way which I hope will unite the court. There is a word that's been on my mind of late. Cryptocracy. K-R-Y-T-O-C-R-A-C-Y. I checked it last night in the Oxford Dictionary. It says government by judges. I do not want to see this court travel outside its authority. It isn't a question of what I would like to say, but what the Constitution will permit me to say. And Earl, understand this. I do not believe that Negroes are an inferior race. Sir, it's Mr. Justice Jackson. Yes? Sir, they just took him to Walter Reed, a heart attack, sir. Mr. Justice Jackson, I'm Earl Warren. Sir, he's resting. Mr. Prettyman is handling his calls. Oh, hello, Barrett. Hello, Mr. Chief Justice. They say he'll make it. Ah. Uh, I talked to him this morning. I think he'll be okay. Good, good. Barrett, uh, as soon as you think he's up to it, ask him to read this. It's important. I know, sir. about with one's mortality as a way of focusing the mind. Since the end of the Civil War, the United States has been hesitating between two worlds. One dead, the other powerless to be born. What you have written is quite remarkable. In very plain and understandable words, it tells the nation what must be done and why. I'm with you, Earl.
You're all by yourself now, Stanley. The fact remains, this court has been given no evidence that the nation knew a century ago that it was outlawing... Stanley, we have eight votes to desegregate. Each of us is concerned about history. Each of us is reluctant to overrule precedents. But we are convinced that the law in this day and age, cannot set Negro school children apart. Not in the United States of America. This country has been making consistent progress in race relations. This decision could impede that progress, halt the march. A piece of paper cannot eradicate the fears and prides and prejudices of the people. Earl, if this court tries to force the southern states to change overnight, there will be resistance, litigation, disobedience, and years of conflict. Believe. Stanley, I'm a politician. I've worked for the people for over 30 years now. I've seen them in police stations, hospitals, unemployment lines. I'm convinced that the people will accept a ruling that fortifies their inner conscience. Let the backbone come from the court, and it'll strengthen the moral backbone of the people who live in conflict. Stanley, a fully united court will send a signal to this nation. I pray that you'll see your way clear to join the majority. be on the midnight train. Supreme Court. Come on, Bob, come on. I think you'll want to be in court this morning, boys. Nine copies, sir, for the Britain. States are invited to draw near and give their attention for the court is now sitting. These cases come to us from the states of Kansas, South Carolina, Virginia, and Delaware. They are premised on different facts, 
and different local conditions, but a common legal question justifies their consideration together. In approaching this question, we cannot turn the clock back to 1868 when the 14th Amendment was adopted, or even to 1896 when Plessy versus Ferguson was written. We must consider public education in the light of its present place in American life. Only in this way can it be determined if segregation in public schools deprives these young plaintiffs of the equal protection of the laws. In these days, it is doubtful that any child may reasonably be expected to succeed in life if he is denied the opportunity of an education. Such an opportunity, where the state has undertaken to provide it, is a right which must be made available to all on equal terms. We come then to the question presented. Does segregation of children in public schools solely on the basis of race, even though the physical facilities may be equal, deprive the children of the minority group of equal education opportunities? We believe unanimously that it does. We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Therefore, we hold that the plaintiffs and others similarly situated for whom the actions have been brought are, by reason of the segregation complained of, deprived of the equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. It is so ordered.